Hello, hello, hello. How's everyone doing today? Um, we are back for another um, episode of Perspectives with Black Men. Today is part six of the 10 part series um, where we are talking today with fathers uh, and talking about fatherhood and gaining a little bit of wisdom from our elders. And so we wanted to do both in honor of Father's Day coming up on Sunday. We really wanted to um, have a conversation about fatherhood and with fathers um, because those uh, are individuals who are um, have different perspectives in our black community and from black men and they can share um, some great perspectives with us. And so we have um, four great individuals here. We do have one person who may join us um, a little bit later. If so, we'll introduce him as he comes on. But we want to introduce uh, some great panelists that we have. Um, we have fathers um, who are in their teens, um, who have children in their teens, all the way up to fathers who have, um, or a father who has um, children um, in their 40s. So. Uh, I think this will be a very interesting, great discussion. So first we have up um, Jay Young. Um, he is from Toledo. Um, he's 58 years old and he uh, has been a father for over 23 years. Um, and he has one daughter that he's proud of um, and talks about all the time. So we wanna welcome him. Uh, Jay, if you wanna introduce yourself uh, for everybody. Good evening. I'm Jay Young, an educator in the Toledo Public Schools. I've been doing that for 36 years on all levels, elementary, junior high, and high school. I've been a teacher and a dean and an assistant principal. I received my education from the University of Toledo, Bachelor of Art and a Master of Education. And like I said, I've been a, a father for 23 wonderful years. Uh, very proud of my daughter. 2019, a graduate of Bowling Green State University. She's taken her gap year and is finishing that right now. We'll be leaving in a few months to begin her graduate work at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Jay, for um, being here, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, next, we have um, the good doctor, uh, Pastor David Young. I'm sorry. Wow. David Nelson. Uh, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Nelson uh, with us. Uh, he's from right, I mean, well, he lives right here in Akron. He's 42 years old and has um, a father for over 14 years. He has two children, a son who's 14 and a daughter who's 12. So welcome, uh, Pastor Nelson, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. N.J. Akbar. Uh, glad to be uh, with everyone, certainly on tonight, and all the brothers to share in uh, this uh, very impactful and influential conversation on fatherhood. Uh, so thank you again for hosting us and having us. Um, Pastor David Nelson, uh, senior pastor, New Hope Baptist Church, Akron, Ohio. Uh, have two uh, wonderful children, uh, 14 uh, as my son and 12 years old is my uh, daughter. Uh, and so it's been great uh, raising them and, and learning more about myself and learning about them. 
um, background, also education, um, graduate of St. Joe's University with a Bachelor of Science degree, uh, sociology, Master's of Education from Lincoln University, um, as well as a Master's of Divinity from Ashton Theological Seminary, and then a Doctor of Ministry from United Theological Seminary in Transformational Leadership. Wow, thank you very much. Thank you for being on. Um, next, we have, um, I think, one of the most um, prolific individuals I know, um, and I just love hearing his poetry um, and actually hearing his uh, African drumming as well. Um, and, and I've learned a lot from him over the last 11 years or so that I've known him um, and want to just thank um, Baba Okanta for being here with us. He's 67 um, and has um, seven uh, children between the ages of 21 and 46. So he's been in this fatherhood thing for over 46 years. And so thank you for joining us, um, Baba. Yes, NJ, it is, it is so good to be here. And it is so good to be here to share this space with these other brothers. Um, my full name is Muatabu Okanta. Uh, I'm a poet, a writer, a musician. Uh, I'm an associate professor at uh, State University. Uh, I've been here at Kent for 30 years. Uh, before Kent, uh, I was the assistant to the director of Black Studies at Cleveland State. Uh, I was there for seven years. I ran their Afro-American Cultural Center. Uh, and before that, uh, I was at Rutgers for a year and a half teaching writing in their English department. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from Kent State in English and in African studies. And uh, I have a master's degree in creative writing uh, from the City College of New York. Um, my oldest daughter is uh 46 she'll be 46 she also so i'm also a grandfather she has a 16 year old daughter um she went to morgan state uh my next daughter is 32 um she's in philadelphia she uh finished a doctorate in pharmacy two years ago uh and then with my present wife, I have five children. Uh, our oldest daughter is, uh, she'll be 28. She's a mother, she's a wife. She has two sons, so I have two grandsons. Um, and then uh, my next daughter uh, graduated from Kent. She's single, she works. Uh, her younger sister, is working on a master's degree in Kent. And I have two sons who are musicians. Uh, one works at a daycare center and his brother works at a nursing home. So my, my children keep me busy. Yes, uh, and grandchildren, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, I love my grandchildren. That being a grandparent is very special. Wow, yeah, so uh, we might talk about that. Might want you to share a little bit more about uh, that um, there. Um, next, we have um, Ardell Ricks. Uh, we're excited to have him here. Ardell is um, 60 and he has one daughter who's 21 um, and that he's very proud of as well. So um, Ardell um, isn't able to join us right now on video, but we wanted to hear from him, have him introduce himself. So you'll hear from him in a second. Okay, I'm, I'm here and Jay, I'm just not here on, uh, I say on video. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, okay, and my name you. is Arndell. My name is Arndell Ricks. Uh, I am currently re retired as a career. I spent a career as a hospital administrator. Uh, however, not related to my education. I am educated in chemical engineering from 
Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of Chicago. Uh, I um, I am actually excited to be on the call. I'm excited about fatherhood. Uh, I have a daughter who's wonderful. She uh, makes every day better for me. And she makes it better for me because of the things that I get to participate in and do to help make her life better than mine. Wow, that's fantastic, uh, Brother Ricks. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, and last but not least, we are um, joined uh, very much so by uh, Brother Shelton. Um, we we'll definitely want to introduce him. He is 64 and he has two children. He's been a father for over 39 years. Uh, he has uh, two daughters who are 39 and 37. Um, and eight grand um, children. Oh no, I'm sorry. A granddaughter who's eight and a brand new grandson as of yesterday. So congratulations, uh, congratulations, uh, brother Shelton. So if you want to uh, share with us uh, a little bit about yourself as well, um, your education and anything else you want to share with us, um, go right here, right, right ahead. Well, thank you, and I appreciate you having me on the call. Uh, my name is Terrence Shelton. That's my my government name. I'm known in the community as Kwabina, uh, which means I was born on a Tuesday. And uh, I'm an Akron native, went to all the Akron public schools, and I left there immediately and went to an HBCU, Grambling State University, where I played in the band and got a chance to travel those four years and meet some some amazing people and see some probably the most amazing places in the world as a as a participant in that. Uh, uh, married in Atlanta with one of my high school, um, I guess she was a high school sweetheart at the time. Uh, and her family, my family knew each other growing up. My grandparents and her grandparents knew each other growing up. And so it's almost like um, we were put together by, by proxy almost. Uh, but we moved back home, and uh, and of course that's where the divorce take place took place. And so, I'm a divorcee. I have the two daughters that I love dearly, um, which makes it challenging sometimes being a father. Uh, but I, you know, hopefully we can get into some of that conversation as well. But at least uh, I have a really good relationship with them today. I'm here in D.C. area right now, visiting with my youngest daughter who just had a baby, my grandson yesterday. So. It's kind of exciting to be here and to pass down, you know, wisdom to my uh, future son-in-law. And uh, I'm pretty much a retiree, but I'll do a lot of consulting work in the educational arena. Uh, have worked with Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company uh, with my background, my bachelor's degree in industrial arts with tech, uh, drafting and design as a specialty. So I did a lot of engineering work at Goodyear for several years. I left there and went to the University of Akron and ran the Upper Bound program for another 10 years working with students and then left there working with the Ohio Department of Education uh, as the um, person in our region responsible for opening up community and charter schools across our, our state. So I do that kind of work now as a consultant and a community developer currently. And uh, I am passionate about all things uh, black related to the, our development, our improvement and our empowerment uh and uh, that's enough for now i mean it's a work it's a work in progress and i'm always open to learning new things and so with that i'll turn it back to you brother nj oh i'm of course i'm one of the distinguished men of alpha phi alpha attorney incorporated i can't leave that out uh but i'll yes. turn it back to you brother nj <laughs> thank you very much we have one sigma on the groups uh on this call and one person who's not in a greek organization but we won't shame any of them that's all. right. Uh, because they still are brothers, right? Right. They're still are really? brothers. Yeah. So um, uh, thank you uh, all for introducing yourselves. We're going to jump right in. Uh, we're going to go in the same exact order um, as we did introductions. But um, as I thought about fatherhood and um, wisdom from our elders, I, wanted, I, I was thinking about what are some of the things that people would want to know, right? So... Um, I'm not a father, so but I have a father, clearly, um, who I love very dearly, who's actually recovering from 
a surgery. So I just want to just say to my father how much I appreciate him and thank him for everything he's done in my life. And hopefully he gets well very, very soon. Um, yeah, so just wanted to, to shout out my father. Um, and so with that being said, I think that we all as black men, um, those of us who are fortunate enough to have our fathers in our lives, um, have learned a lot of things from our fathers. And so um, I would imagine that as fathers, you've learned a lot of things from us, right? From your children and just having children and being a father. So I wanted to start off with this question. Can you talk to us about what fatherhood has meant to you? And we'll start with Jay and go in the same order. Okay, I'll tell everybody that, you know, I'm not the Sigma and I'm not the independent, uh, obviously a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. You know, you know fatherhood has, has been incredible to me. You know, it, it's something that, you, you know, I think many of us, I certainly wanted to be a, a father um, for many years, you know, even before I was. Uh, but we were blessed with our daughter um, three years after we were married. Uh, but she has been an, an absolute joy to have. Um, and really, when you think about it, it's, it's hard to believe that she's, first of all, been around for, for 23 years. Uh, the years have gone by so fast. It seems like we were just yesterday looking at daycare facilities. And then a second after that, it was kindergarten and then high schools and then the university search. But, you know, she's been a tremendous joy and has really taught uh, both of us, you know, my wife and I, a great many things. Uh, obviously, an insight into this this generation, um, but she's been an, an, an incredible, an incredible joy, and 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 has taught uh, taught me uh, patience uh, and just a lot about life in general. So, um, very interesting question in terms of what fatherhood is. Um, to me, I've learned so much from my, from my kids and, and being a father and um, uh, fortunate enough to uh, grow with a father and a stepfather who are now uh, both deceased and um, some of the things that I've learned from them and applying that to uh, my own practice of being a father and really uh, trying to bring out the best in my children. Um, and, and making sure that um, I help guide them from where they are to where God wants them to be. And so it's, it's been a joy. Um, of course, there's some challenging moments. Um, of course, it's learning them and it's learning them at the different stages of their life. Um, like, you know, Brother Young said, you know, you can go back and remember that, you know, you was just looking for a daycare for them to go to and just the maturation and, and how they've grown and, um, and seeing that and seeing the development of their personalities and how certainly their personalities have changed. And so um, looking at them uh, brings, you know, much joy uh, certainly to my life, um, but there's also a level of, of accountability and responsibility, um, raising a son and a daughter and, um, and, you know, teaching them to as siblings, to make sure that um, I was just speaking to him on yesterday and I asked him to make me a promise. I said, promise that you always have each other's back. I said, I'll be here um, or maybe gone. Um, but I wanna make sure that as siblings, uh, that both of you will always have each other's back and uh, you can rely on each other as brothers and sisters. And so I feel as though that's very important to teach those lessons and, um, and life lessons as well and mistakes I've made over the years and making sure uh, to give them the wisdom that they need so they won't make the same mistakes. To use my life as a roadmap and say, um, 
you know, try to use my life and uh, to trot out your own path. Use it as a guide to help you make good decisions. Um, <laughs> like uh, my brother Kwabena, um on the one hand, I know about divorce. Uh, I've been divorced twice. And so my two oldest um, daughters, uh, I know what it's like to be separated from my children. Uh, and I know what it's like on the one with one of them to have been able to repair the damage. Uh, not so much with my second child. Uh, and that's always very, very difficult. Um, but I was blessed to uh, meet my wife. My wife and I have been together 29 years. We're going on 30 years. We've had five children. Uh, so I have three more daughters, uh, and, and one of the things that I've learned uh, as a father raising girl children, uh, and, and I would express it the way I express it to my students. I teach a course uh, called The Black Man Historical Perspectives. And, and I tell young brothers, you know, if, if you mistreat the young woman in your life, take uh, your mother's, sisters, et cetera, for granted, God will give you daughters to raise. And so God gave me daughters to raise. Um, and, and through my daughters, I've learned how to appreciate women uh, I've learned how to be honest with myself in relationship to women. Um, and, you know, I've been blessed to have two sons. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult being a black parent living in a white society, uh, whether we have sons or daughters. Uh, it is particularly challenging um, when we have sons. Uh, and, and so, you know, I share things with my children that I learned from my parents. Um, so, you know, there's nothing more important to me of the things that I've done. There's nothing more important, more significant, more special and just being a parent and now being a grandparent. Okay, I think that was absolutely awesome. And I absolutely uh, want to acknowledge that uh, those that have spoken before me, wow, you sum it up very well. Uh, so I want to say thank you first for that. Uh, uh, our approach to this, my wife and I, because uh, and we definitely both have had uh, big, big roles in making sure that we've done the best job we could do as parents. Now, one thing that, that I remember most is that uh, the hardest part of this always was that you're making it up as you go. There isn't a manual that will give you everything that could possibly happen and how you can deal with the child. Um, so, but here are some of the things that we, we've tried to do. Uh, we've always, uh, encouraged our daughter to be intentional with her plans. Always, uh, know what the outcome you're seeking so that you're always working toward a plan. And in that process, while you're being intentional, you always have to remember to be kind to others. Uh, stay God-centered. If you don't stay God center, you're all over the place. Uh, be proud of who you are and be proud to be an African American person. And 
decide what it is you want out your life and then work hard to be happy. And if you can be happy, you've accomplished all there is to accomplish. Wow, this is good. Um, I think if I can remember the question, that's what that's one thing about being in your 60s. You, if you don't write things down, you ain't gonna remember. <laughs> so let me think, uh, here, here's my answer to that. I think for me, it was a challenge being a father. My dad died before I was born. My mom was, my mom was uh, in her early 20s. I think he was 27. She might've been 23 or 24. And uh, so when he passed away, he left her with me in her stomach. My brother, my oldest brother, who's now deceased, was um, had just turned two or about to turn two. And my sister had just turned three. And they just bought a home. Uh, their first home. And so he never got a chance to move in it. My mom was carrying me. So she was in a lot of grief while she carried me. And I think that's probably why I'm such an empathic kind of a person, very sensitive to, to people's pain. So knowing, having that as my introduction into the world made it very challenging because I'm fighting for my life on so many different levels. Uh, uh, and it was, if it hadn't been for my uncles and some male mentors in my life in high school, uh, life probably would have ended up very different for me, you know, probably incarcerations. I don't think I'd ever gone to Grambling. I probably would have never picked up my master's in education. I, I mean, things would have been very different. And so I bring that into my experience as a father. And uh, my fear was not living past 27. Since my dad died at 27, I didn't think I would live past 27. My daughter was born uh, when she, when I was in my probably 23, 22, somewhere in there. So I was a young parent uh, and I didn't have a manual about fatherhood from, from my dad. I didn't have any guidance or direction or information passed on to me from other men who were fathers. I didn't have any idea about the birthing process and the changes that happens and all that. I didn't have any concept of what it means once the baby is born you know, to, you know, how isolated you're going to feel as a part of that process, because it's all about the baby and the mother at that point in time. So there was a lot of things that, you know, I learned, I, I learned by rope, and I'm still learning, you know, as, uh, as a grandfather, uh, and, and providing some guidance and assistance to the men that are in my daughter's lives. And my my challenge was because I knew that I, my dad died early was to make sure that whatever I knew, whatever I learned up in, in my life up to that point, I wanted to transfer to them so that in the event that I too would leave prematurely or earlier in life, they would at least know me. They would know my positions on life. They would have the instillment of my value system uh, and my African centered culture and consciousness and that they would be able to fight and defend for themselves and protect themselves in the event that you know people came at them in an in a, in a inappropriate way, whether it's male or female. So it was a lot of energy towards for me uh, in my introduction to fatherhood to make sure that my my children were prepared in the event that I would not be with them. And here I am, you know, 64, and God has blessed that opportunity for me to not only spend life with them and learn with them and grow with them. And like uh, Baba Kanto said, you know, uh, it's a constant learning process and girls teach you what it means to how to love. Cause I wanted all boys. And so here I am with two girls, but so they showed me what it means to be loving and to love and, you know, that kind of thing, man. I, you know, I didn't want to sit up there holding the doll baby's hair while they braid and talking to me 16 miles an hour. I mean, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll, I'll do this. But right, they taught me how to yield and to submit to to love, and um, so and it's a growing process because I still got I'm still surrounded with females, you know, except for yesterday. So I'm like super excited to finally have another male in the family. Um, so I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes, you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I want to go to the next question because we have um, some, you know, a lot of people, um, you you all shared that you wanted to be fathers many years before you actually became fathers. So 
Um, what advice would you give to new fathers like um, uh, Brother Shelton, like your um, future son-in-law potentially and other younger generations who are looking to change, looking to make changes in their community? What advice would you give to them? Starting with Jay in the exact same order. Well, clearly, if you want to change the community, then you're going to change the community. Uh, you're talented, you're intelligent, uh, you're educated, whether that is with a degreed uh, intelligence or life experience intelligence, you can do that. Uh, if you're a new father and you're interested in changing the community, clearly you have to educate your child. You have to prepare your child or your children. And I think that it's critical when you are preparing your child that you have to, just like my father did, tell them from where they are from. And that starts with Mother Africa. You have to educate them, teach them all of the glories of that continent uh, and let them know that they have all the talent in the world. But of course you have to prepare them for all of life and what is before them. You know, obviously we've been in, in a period of great change in this country. Clearly we have talked about the conversation uh, that we have to have with our children to prepare them for life, you have to tell them that they have to be better. They can't just be equal, but they have to be better. Uh, and so clearly, if you tell them where they're from, where they need to go, uh, then they can certainly be change agents in the community, uh, as can you and anybody in the generation, but you have to you have to be there, you have to mentor. You've heard obviously about it takes a village. Well, you have to be about that village and you have to be in the business of lifting everybody up so that they can uh, help. It's, it's clear that uh, we have to uplift everyone uh, if we want to make a change. Yes, um, being a new father, um, I think it's very important to um, enjoy the moments. Uh, don't take the moments for granted. Um, capture the moments as much as you can, uh, either through uh, video or pictures, um, so that you can remind yourself of those moments and your children as they get older as well, too. Um, I think living in the moment, I think oftentimes uh, as the father, you look back and uh, the years can go by so fast and um, you're trying to do so much um, in terms of, um, you know, providing for your children that you can possibly miss those moments. And so just being present in the moment. Um, and um, I think that's very important. Also, um, understanding uh, how to sow into your kids, how to tend to them how to purge some things away, but also how to cultivate their mind. Um, and I think all of those things are important um, because there are different stages to be able to do that you know, for your children. What do you need to sow into them? And is sowing into them and training them with the end in mind. Um, uh, like Brother Shelton said, um, it's, 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 you will not be a father if you cannot prepare your children for your absence. And so it's important to prepare your children for the time that you won't be here because you never know when that time is gonna come. And so um, I think that's very important. So how do you train them with the end in mind? If, if this was your last year on earth, how, how, do, how do you, what are you gonna tell them? And uh, what do you wanna pour into them? And they may not be able to use it now, but it's important for them to know this so they can go into their toolbox whenever they need to use it 
they can pull it out and say, my dad taught me that. My dad exposed me to that. My dad shared that with me, um, you know, and shared with them as, as early as you can, um, because you never know what life circumstances they're going to face, but they can remember the advice. They have something, a reference point, something you expose them to. Um, so from, from their origin in terms of who they are, so they have a cultural identity, uh, they have affirmation, um, and uh, continue to affirm them and validate them that they are important, that they do have a place um, in this world and something to contribute, no matter what, get, what their gifting is. And so I think that's important to, to share that and to pour into our kids so that we can um, die empty uh, because we poured so much into them. Um, as far as giving advice, uh, my son-in-law, <laughs> uh, is a new father. Um, and, and all I can tell him is one, it is being a father, being a husband, um, is about learning how to be selfless, that there's more to life than you um, and just the responsibility for taking care of your family. Um, I learned from my own father and, and my grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather, uh, to teach my own children by example. Um, and so if, if I want to teach my children about where they come from, then I have to learn. Uh, and, and in my particular case, that's always been a passion and it's become uh, my life work. Um, and so it's, it's allowed me to preserve a lot of information um, so in a sense, my children don't have to go to the library. All they have to do is come upstairs because uh, books and video and records and music um, has always been in the household. Uh, images of themselves uh, because raising girls, uh, America sends them all kinds of not so subtle uh, images that would lead them to believe that they are not beautiful. Uh, that's what led Chris Rock to, to put together uh, that documentary, Good Hair. Um, teaching, teaching my sons that uh, <laughs> life is not a video game, you know. Um, and so, I mean, that's the same advice that, that I give my son-in-law uh, and to also let him know that I'm here to talk to when he needs to talk. Cause you know, we all know what that is. You know, I think it was Ardell who said it. There, there's no blueprint, there's no handbook um, I mean, yes, I grew up in a household where my father was in the household, but at the same time, I still had to learn how to be a father by being a father. Um, and so that there were things that my father could not or did not teach me. Um, there were things about my father. My father was an alcoholic. Um, and so I had to learn from my father how to deal with the pressures of being a black man in this society, uh, but not being bitter because, you know, when we become bitter, that filters into our children. Um, so, so it's a challenge but it's our children that keep us in touch with our humanity. 
And so no matter what was going on in my day, I could come home to my children and how could I not smile? Uh, how can I not leave all of that other stuff on the outside? Uh, and so that's what I've gotten from my children. And even though my children are grown, that's, that's what I still get um, from my children. Um, and so I'm old enough now to get a great joy of seeing myself and seeing my wife in our children. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's still a struggle, but family is the beginning, it's the glue. Uh, as far as wanting to help our community, change our community, as, as I think is the word that you use, NJ, I would say change has to begin in us um, and work its way from the inside out. Um, given what I do for a living, working to help our community is daunting. You know, I love black people, but we're not always the easiest people to work with. Um, and so I say that to say that, you know, if we wanna help our community, we also have to study it. We also have to do our homework because our community is diverse. Um, everybody in our community doesn't go to church, but just because they don't go to church doesn't believe they, it doesn't mean that they don't believe in God. You know, we have Muslims in the community. We have people who practice traditional African belief systems in our community. Um, and so if we're gonna work with the community, we have to tailor our message to deal with the diversity. If I'm, if I'm speaking to a group and they're in the nation of Islam, I'm not gonna to speak to them the way I speak to a group that's in a Baptist church you know, while at the same time, some of the message is going to be the same, but our community is diverse and we need to recognize that, uh, especially now because we're in a historic moment um, and we have to move our community forward. I can go on, so I'll just stop. We can't hear you, Arndale. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. My advice to any young father is actually pretty simple. Uh, my, my first and foremost thing that I would like every young father to remember is that your job, first and primarily, is to provide. And if you remember that you are supposed to provide, but I don't limit the word provide to money. You're supposed to provide what's needed. And if you provide what's needed, uh, it's gonna cover a whole lot of territory and you'll find out that you are putting full energy into fatherhood. What I'd like to talk about is growth and learning. Uh, Fathers have to make sure that that's what's happening in their home, is that children are growing, they're learning, and they're giving their best to achieve what's available to them. And as far as moving forward and encouraging uh, those who want to do things in the community to move the community in better directions or in different directions, uh, as a father, one of the things that you have to do is always remain open-minded to change and realize that change is neither good nor bad. It's different, and it can be either good or bad, but you have to be open-minded to at least hear it and understand it and then uh, help by, once again, uh, providing what's needed in order for that child to move forward in, in the change. It's pretty simple for me. Wow. Amen. Um, 
Man, this is a, a loaded question, man. It needs so much more time. But um, for me, the advice that I give, that I would give to a new, new parent, new father, uh, first, I guess, first of all, it would begin with what's the relationship I have with the new father, because everything kind of centers around relationship. And if you don't have one, then it's going to be very difficult for you to even communicate whatever you know to anybody if you don't have that relationship. And so I will begin first by making sure that I have an open and transparent, honest relationship with the young father, with my new fathers, right? Whether they're my son-in-laws or whether they're men in the community who are becoming fathers, uh, you know, making sure that I have the relationship that I can share with them openly and honestly with them and they would be willing to share with me openly, and honestly, and listen. Um, so I think it begins with relationship. Uh, it continues with transparency and honesty. Um, uh, the conversation that I had with my son-in-law, uh, my future son-in-law, is that I just kind of shared with him about becoming a father, and especially of a male son, because we knew it was a boy. And I just shared with him that he's going to watch every single thing you do. So you, you have to live by example on how he treats women is going to be how he watches you treat your mother. I mean, treat his, his mother and that, um, and so you have to be what you, you know, be what you are hoping for him to be, you know, or your child to be. You have to be that in the home and you have to live that every day. And it's a challenge because, you know, sometimes we still want to be our own selves and we want to, you know, do what we think is in the best interest as opposed to what's in the best interest of our families. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a challenge. Sometimes it's very humbling to, to submit to you know, to information that might not be coming from you and maybe coming from, you know, your wife or, you know, it's very humbling. Um, but I believe that it starts with the relationships because relationships are everything. I mean, it's where love, it's where love blooms, you know. So I would say there it starts with that. And oftentimes as older men, um, it's very difficult for younger men to hear us. And probably because if we don't have that relationship or we haven't taken the time to build the relationship or, People are angry because of the lack of relationships that they may have that may have not had with their fathers. But I would say open up and listen to, you know, and to build the relationship so that that generational wisdom can be transferred to you and to your family. I mean, we know a lot as, as older men. We know a lot. We've been through a lot. We've seen a lot. And we are not the father that abandoned you. We're not the man that hurt you. We're not that person. Give us an opportunity to be the, the, you know, the elders, so to speak, that that's necessary for the generational wisdom to transfer through the family. And then as far as community is concerned, I would say, um, first of all, we got to have a common definition of what community is, what neighbors is, you know, you know, it's very, in this day and time, we don't even know who our neighbors are. So it's very difficult for us to have community, not knowing who lives right next to you. The common unity, which is, is, is coming to a same place of values and, you know, uh, beliefs and things like that, that, you know, you look out for one another, you watch after one another. And it's very difficult to have a true community when we don't have communication with one another, and especially with those who are close to us that's in our community. We don't know. So, you know, reaching out to those people, being neighborly you know, sharing, you know, sharing values and things with the people who are right in your environment, it begins there in terms of building community. And um, like I said, you lead by example in the home first um, and, and you empower, we empower, we have to empower, you know, our, our people who are younger that have that energy, empower them to go forward and support them with our finances. Because one thing we do have as older people, we have money, because we, you know, we, most of, a lot of us have money because we have retirements and things that we built over time that a lot of young people just aren't even seeing as a value. So we can help. So um, helping to empower them and to support them and to making sure that we have the same value system um, and building with those who are like-minded with you so that as you begin to build with those who are like-minded with you, you begin to create this sense of community and it doesn't really happen in church either anymore because, you know, in my day, most of the people that were in church with me were people who were in my neighborhood. So now we have churches of people stop, coming from any and everywhere that may not even live anywhere in proximity to the church. 
So it's very difficult. So you got to create community again. You got to begin to talk about what is community as a value. You know, it goes back to family. Communities are based on families. Families make neighborhoods and neighborhoods make communities. And so back to the basics is where I say we begin building those relationships in, in our homes with our, with our uh, you know, with our families and with our extended families and people who are, are connected to us by proxy, whether they are students or our parishioners or whomever, building these relationships of trust. Uh, and there's no silver bullet. It's a combination of all this stuff we're talking about, right? It's the conversations that we have in a, and the building of these relationships over time and the trust that comes with that. You know, I mean, I don't know it all. I just know what I know and then I share that. And then I'm open to hearing what others people can share so I could continue to grow and be empowered in the place that I am in my life right now. All right, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for sharing. I think that one of the things that I think about uh, when I think about my father, for example, um, I think about the lessons in which he's taught me. And a lot of those lessons that he has taught me or tried to teach me and I didn't listen were uh, to prevent me from going down um, roads that had potholes um, that I could avoid. And many of them, he said, well, son, I, I tried to tell you it was there, but you still wanted to touch you know, the, the, the stove. And I told you it was hot, but you just had to see for yourself, right? Um, and so when you think about those things that you've learned, what are some of the regrets that you have um, that I think some of our um, people watching would just wanna know so that they don't uh, make some of those same mistakes? Jay? I think that everybody has setbacks. Uh, you're not going to always get everything that you want. I cannot say, however, that I have regrets. Yeah, you know, every time something hasn't quite happened the way. I wanted to, you know, there's a reason for that. And I always look at my faith and I've always believed that the good Lord is not going to give you something that is, is too heavy for you to handle. And we are strengthened by some of those challenges that we have been dealt. I cannot say, however, that that there are things that I have lived to regret. So that's a very interesting question. Um, Dr. NJ, looking, you know, over my life, I think that um, I've looked at them as, you know, moments, you know, like Brother Young was sharing, as setbacks and learning from those experiences, learning so that you have learning moments and growth moments. That's not necessarily about winning or losing, but winning and learning and how to learn and how to improve. Um, of course, in life, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make many mistakes. We're going to continue to make mistakes. Um, and I think it's learning from uh, those mistakes, but also growing in wisdom. So you don't make as many mistakes as you used to make, um, or they may not be as detrimental uh, to others around you. And I think, you know, part of being um, a man, um, along with being a father, is understanding the weight of the responsibility and being able to bear that weight and know that oftentimes a lot of that weighs on you. Um, and so when you're making choices and making decisions, you have to factor in the risks. You got to factor in who's going to affect. Um, and you can't make decisions carelessly, but you have to make them carefully and, and stand with your decision, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, and say and be able to admit, hey, I made a mistake. 
I'm gonna learn from it um, and being able to move forward um, as, as a better man, um, as you grow as a better man and makes you a better father. Um, I would have to agree with my brothers, Brother Young and, and Brother Nelson. Um, and I've lived long enough. I've, I failed at marriage, uh, but I don't have a regret in the sense that had I not failed in it, um, when I had the opportunity, and for me it was the third time, was the charm. Um, that that failure became a part of who I became. Um, it, it, it forced me to look more critically at myself. A lot of times as men, when we get into a conflict with a woman, you know, we have a difficult time accepting our own responsibility in terms of why the relationship didn't work. Um, and so once I was able to look in the mirror as I searched for the problem and I found the answer, the solution to the problem, looking back at me in the mirror um, and, you know, being humble. Um, and, and so I learned those lessons. Um, and so again, my wife and I have been together 29 years, going on 30 years. Um, I learned exactly what my two eldest daughters missed by my absence. I learned that from being there with my five other children. And so in trying to repair you know, that damage, you, you can never get the time back. But those are lessons learned. Those are lessons that you can, can pass on to your children. And so, you know, we have to live our lives. And again, I agree with my brothers. We have to learn from our mistakes. And, and in learning from our mistakes, that means we have to learn how to forgive ourselves. That's important. Uh, it's hard to answer that question, though, NJ, I'm... Uh very happy i'm very honored to be included because uh, my four brothers on this call uh, that i'm talking to, that i'm listening to first of all they're incredibly brilliant uh but the only thing that i think i want to add uh, to the thing is that uh, if we're doing the best that we can do as we get older we will attain wisdom so if you spend your energy and your time with regrets, you tend not to move forward because you're living in the past. And one of the things that at least my alpha brothers all understand that we thrive on forward steps. And so that's what I would like to think is that uh, we're not going to be a group full of regrets. We're going to be a group that's trying to be better. That's all I got. Ditto. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say, I've never heard a partner actually not say anything. So. <laughs> oh, seriously, man. I, I agree with, with all of them. And I, if I had to really force myself to create a regret, it would probably not realizing sooner that the mistakes that I was making were necessary to make me the person who I am today. Uh, not realizing that, because uh, I beat myself up for a lot of the mistakes I made. And you know, looking back now, I realize that had I not made some of those mistakes, I, would, I wouldn't be the, the, the man that I am today. And, um, and so I, I'm, I embrace my mistakes today and I own them up quickly and, and I move on with them now. So I, I would say that, but as a younger man, uh, the ego is really, really strong. And, uh, you know, I was always, I mean, you know, I was wanting people to know how much I knew, you know, because I didn't have, again, you know, a dad to support or encourage or motivate or whatever. 
So I wanted to let people know what I knew and what I had learned and so forth. And so I think what I would probably do differently is, is to listen more, especially to the, to the older men in my life and learn from uh, the challenges that they had, you know, and talk less when I'm around them uh, to just hear, just to listen more and talk less and then allow what I know to be demonstrated in my actions versus me trying to tell them what I know too, right? I think I would, I would do those things a little bit differently, but um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it with that. Wow. Yeah. Um, that was beautifully said, actually, everybody. Um, I think that just brings back to me why I invited all of you to um, speak uh, today because I, I have deep, profound respect for each and every one of you um, and a different type of relationship with all of you. But I think that I learn different things about you and from you every time I speak to each and every one of you, which um, hopefully those of you who are watching, you may not be able to have the type of relationship I have with these gentlemen, but I hope you've gained something so far um, from them. And we do have some questions in the audience. I'm going to ask them after this final question that we have prepared. And um, we, we'll be together for about 15 more minutes. Um, so the last question that I wanted is, you know, we're, we, we know about what's happening with uh, George Floyd. And uh, we also know that there's a lot of protests and calls for change to happen. Um, and where you sit, uh, what do you believe the solutions or changes that we need to be making um, are? Um, and obviously, we, we don't have time to go into great detail about all of them, but if you can just give us a few of them, um, and we'll start with Jay. And you got to unmute Jay. Okay, so while Jay figures it out, it looks like Jay's trying to figure out why he's not unmuted. We'll go to Dr. Nelson and then come back to Jay. So if I understand the questions in light of um, that happened, all that happened with uh, George Floyd and uh, certainly the injustices that we see and have seen recently, um, what advice or solutions would we offer? Is that correct? Okay, okay. Um, I think, you know, um, I have not been able to really watch the full video. I will say that. Uh, it's too painful, uh, certainly for me to watch, watch it fully. Um, and uh, because of what it stirs up in me and, uh, and all of that and, and just feeling the pain and anger and frustration um, and really wanting to see justice done um, and knowing historically how long this has been going on, uh, certainly in the country. And so I think um, as proud as I am to be a, a Black man, in the word of the boys, we still live in this dual consciousness of what it means to be Black, but what it also means to be an American. And so I think... Um, that, that challenge still lays before us and it has been generational. And, you know, we always have hope that it's going to be better for the next generation. And we have promised moments, but we haven't reached the promised land. And I think that is, that is the sad part because we are still in the year 2020. Um, but we can encourage um, this generation to keep on fighting uh, the fight for justice and, um, and for freedom and for equality um, in our country and having them to understand that we are not living in a post-racial society, despite what um, others may think, um, that no matter your class, your degree, your wealth, what side of the tracks you live on, how big your house is, you will still be a person of suspicion in this country. Um, and just understanding how to exist with that 
not live with the fear of it, but live with it with a social consciousness um, that you still matter, you still are important. Um, and, um, and so I think, you know, joining the protests, I, I, I'm saluting all, all of the protests that's going on, um, you know, in our country, um, but really wanted to make sure change is happening from a policy perspective as well. So um, the pen is always mightier than the sword. And so we want to make sure that that policies are changing um, across our country and we continue to to make sure that um, that we're leaving a legacy and that this generation is picking up the mantle and, and running full speed. Um, and so I'll leave with that. Yeah. So thank you. We just, we just uh, have to keep on keeping on. One second. Uh, one second oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just one second. I know um, Dr. Nelson has to leave actually, so he's going to be jumping off. I just wanted to thank him for being here and providing his perspective. Glad to be with all you brothers. Glad to meet all of you. Certainly, for sure. It was a pleasure. So can you share, just before you leave, uh, how people can get in touch with you if they wanted to find out uh, more about you? Uh, Want to get in contact with me? Um, Pastor Nelson at newhopecity.org. That is the email address, Pastor Nelson at newhopecity.org. They can certainly, um, uh, I'm on Instagram, um, Pastor Nelson, uh, also on uh, Facebook, Pastor David Nelson. And so uh, look me up through those social media platforms, uh, hit me up via email, um, and um, certainly watch live um, service streaming every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., uh, Facebook Live, New Hope Baptist Church Facebook page. All right. Thank you very All much. Right. All right. Thank you, brothers. No problem. Learned a ton from you. Thanks, man. Yes. All right, uh, Jay, I'm sorry. I was saying that we simply need to keep on keeping on. Uh, unlike those of us on this panel, this country takes plenty of backward steps. Uh, it takes backward steps and then it moves forward. We had the eight Obama years and then with the being who's there now on Pennsylvania Avenue, we have gone backward. But we just need to be prepared to move forward and we need to keep fighting. We certainly have it better than our ancestors had when they landed here in 1619. Uh, we, we are a strong people. We will continue to achieve and we will fight through this setback um, and there are many, many brighter days ahead, but we simply need to keep fighting. We need to keep educating ourselves. We need to use the rights that our ancestors fought to give us. We need to exercise the right to vote and we need to educate those people who don't necessarily see the value in that. Extremely flawed, but if you look at actually the precepts of the country, they are good, they're flawed, but we simply need to uh, accept those. And you know, again, when you look, when you're talking about uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and you, you look at the Constitution, it actually is, is pretty decent, but we just need to fight through all of that and make sure that those words, and we all know that when the forefathers said the words that they did, they didn't necessarily include us, but we need to simply take what is there and the way we always have, fight and continue to fight, and we will be victorious. I would say that for me, on a personal level, you know, what I see happening now just tells me to keep doing what I've been doing. Um, 
I, I sincerely believe that if we are going to teach our children who they are and what it is they come from, then that becomes the key to resolve the double consciousness that uh, Pastor Nelson alluded to, referred to, uh, that W.E.B. Du Bois articulated in 1903. Um, you know, people need to understand that Dr. Du Bois lived out the end of his life in Ghana. He resolved that issue um, and, and we have to resolve it um, in teaching our young people who they are. You know, our experience begins in Africa. Um, we are descended from the people who not only did they survive being captured, dragged to the coast, they survived being in the dungeons. They survived uh, the Middle Passage. They survived the plantation. They've survived Jim Crow. That is to say, we, we're descended from people that refuse to die. And that energy is, is still in us. And, you know, we have to take control of our destiny. Um, for me personally, my destiny is not just limited to the United States. I'm not waiting to see what white folks gonna do. Um, I just know that as a community, we have to do what we have to do. And, and, and you know, we, we need healing. You know, we have to learn how to lay this burden down. It's been passed to us from one generation to the next. And we have to learn how to lay the burden down. It ain't about hating on white people. It's about loving ourselves and, and creating for ourselves uh, our own. Movement hasn't stopped. Young people are just picking up in their time. Okay. I'm uh, pretty clear about what I think about this question. Uh, first thing is that uh, what I would propose, first of all, is don't give up the fight. Um, if you give up the fight, you are now defeated. And the uh, solution that I would have is actually three-pronged. Uh, the first one is education. We're all better off when we have done the best we can to absorb and learn everything because that's the one thing that can't be taken away from you is what you've learned. The second thing is good health. We have to find a way to be healthy as a people and to protect us and ours. Uh, one of the challenges I have is, is the realization that 95% of black men in America, when they reach the age of 35, have high blood pressure. And it's because of some of the craziness that we have to deal with in this world. And um, uh, live in that duality that, uh, that Pastor Nelson mentioned earlier. Uh, the last thing is economic development. Uh, the best attempt known for our people in economic development was what happened in Tulsa. And that's what it was met with. But uh, we stopped that fight, but maybe we need to continue it. Wow, this is, again, a loaded question, man. And I, uh, I'm gonna try to respect your request to make it short, Doc. So I guess the first thing for me would be for me to realize and everybody else who, who, who are experiencing this in this day and time to realize that that his death, uh, when he died, I died with him. A part of me died with him. And so because I live, the living part of me has to fight for his, for his and the others who have died unjustly for their justice. That's number one. It, it has to be a collective pain that we feel that's gonna feel that, we, that moves us to a collective action, right? And then, I, you know, for me, a time for talking is just over. I'm done talking. 
we've said it and said it all over and over again, time for talking is over. And so now it has to be solution based. It has to be, you know, specific to the issues and that the, um, and it has to be spelled out in action form. I think the other thing is that, uh, um, and, and that the fight is necessary. When I think about this in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was building a wall. He did this an enormous task in 52 days, but in that 52 days, he had opposition and haters and people who tried to prevent them from accomplishing that task. And so knowing that we're gonna have people that's gonna be uh, trying to stop this work, as Nehemiah told the builders, everybody took responsibility for the area around their wall. They built with one hand and they had a knife in the other hand to, to address those folks who were trying to stop the work. So we have to be vigilant on both ends. We have to be conscious and action oriented, but we also have to be prepared to fight because this is a, this is a war that we're in. And because it is a war, people who, we have to look at those who are our opponents and our enemies in this oppression uh, to realize that they're not trying to be friends with us. They're not trying to be kumbaya with us. They're just not, they've not been, their history shows that, that they're not been, they haven't been uh, throughout their own history with other peoples across the world. But for us, it's a very de deliberate attack against us and particularly African-American or black men. So I say we have to realize that these folks ain't trying to be friends with us. They're not trying to be peaceful with us. They're not trying to have this place of of humanity with us that that's the, that is required for all human beings and so we have to fight for that right that humanity for our freedom and for uh and, and and realize that this that the fight is worth fighting for even if it means our lives and then empower our young men our young women our youth empower them with 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 weapons that are effective for victory not just words, but empower them with the with weapons that's going to allow them to be victorious in the fight, right? I have a I have a responsibility to end this fight, but I'm not the warrior that I used to be anymore, you know. So I have to empower those warriors who are in my life with information and with wisdom and with words and with money and with weapons and everything I can empower them with, so that when they go out there and fight, they know that they're supported at home. Um, so I'll end with that just to keep it short. Wow. Thank you very much, everyone, for sharing. Um, I just want to, because we're talking about perspectives of Black men, and we know how our words can sometimes be misconstrued, so I just want to clarify for everyone what I believe uh, Kwame and I was saying about, you know, arming our individuals, uh, those uh, people who are coming after you, with weapons that they need to, to fight in the war. Um, you're not necessarily talking about guns, you're talking about resources, you're talking about wisdom, you're talking about being there as a guiding force of mentorship, correct? Just wanna make sure. No, I'm talking about all of it. I'm talking about oh, all of it. We, gotta, we have to prepare our people to fight with weapons that will defend their families because they ain't shooting to play guns. This girl that just got killed in Akron, I'm hearing it, I'm talking about a girl that get killed in Akron by, this, by a guy that drives by and just shoots her up in her car, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be ready to protect our families and defend our families and our neighborhoods and our communities. They've already dismantled our neighborhoods and communities. So we don't feel a sense of, of community and brotherhood with one another anymore. So we have to, that has to be changed. And so, yes, I'm saying empower us with words of, the, you know, to fight, to write legislation and do all that kind of stuff. We need those folks to do that. But we also need folks who know how to, how, how to weaponize, how to, and how to, and, and, and to act in a military kind of a form to protect us from those people who are trying to kill us. Yes, I'm saying all of them, I'm sorry, sir. No, no, you're good. I just wanted to make sure uh, we had some clarity um because usually they, they you know people say all of our words are you know aggressive um so i didn't know exactly what uh you meant there but i'm glad you clarify you mean in the broadest sense like all of those things so thank all you all of it the same um, way marcus garvey said what he said and malcolm yeah. said what he said and and i mean it's it's like that's what time it is i mean we have to be responsible but we also have to protect ourselves 
right, right. And, and to protect what's ours. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a poem about the Atlanta riot in, in mm -hmm. 1899 and where, just like in Tulsa, they came into our community and they ransacked it. They burned yes. it. They slaughtered yep. our people. But now this is W.E.B. Du Bois. He said the riot ended when the men went home and got their shotguns. Yeah. And now he didn't yeah. say they went out and did anything to anybody, but they made it clear, this has got to stop. You come up in here, we will defend ourselves. You know, in, in the Tulsa riot in, in, in 1921, black soldiers attempted to protect them. That's part of what made those white folks go off even more, that black men had the audacity to arm themselves in an attempt to protect their neighborhood. So, you know, this is the conversation we got to have. Yeah. You know, this is the conversation we got to have. And we got brothers that been in the military. You know, they know how to train us in the proper use of weapons and, and, and all of that. And to not be irresponsible, you know, in, in terms of how we're going to protect ourselves on all levels. Yeah. Wow. So thank you very much uh, for that. And I really appreciate it. We do have three questions. We won't ask all of them because I think you just answered some of them. Um, one of them was how, how do we uh, advice do we give our black kings and queens or our sons and daughters about being kings and queens? I think um, Baba Akanta did a great job of talking about we are basically the descendants of uh, the survivors. I love every time you you mention that. It just it just rings true to me, and it just reminds me that yes, we like we we have the tenacity in us because our in our blood is survival. In our blood is survival. So right. I appreciate. But, but let me say this on that too. I mean, we we need to become clearer and more critical in our thinking. When we study our history, we were, we were not just kings and queens. Some of the yeah. kings are the ones who participated in selling us yeah. into slavery. How we got here. Yeah. Okay, so yes, we have royalty and we have all of that, but we were artisans. We, 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 we were all kinds of things in our history that, that stand as a testament to and a lesson for what it is we can continue to be. Wow, yes. So the next question is, um, I think this is the last question I'll ask. There's a question about um, how to deal with police, um, like any messages you share um, with your children about police. I think what I'll do there is I'll put that question in the comment box if any of you want to go back and provide your feedback on that one. Um, actually, on the video in the comments, that will be great. But just for, uh, you know, moving us along, I'll ask this question. I thought it was a good question. Um, you know, Lola asked, uh, what advice do you give to fathers who are not in their children's lives? You, know, you all being fathers, what advice would you give them? Um, I know in my particular case, you have to work, have some kind of working relationship with their mothers. With my older daughter and my first wife, we worked through it, um, and we we become friends, and that makes it much easier to continue to be uh, in an estranged child's life. And if if you don't work that out, it it becomes very very difficult until they become grown, and and they can make decisions for themselves. Uh, Jay, then Ardell, and then Bob. I just think that, you know, where there is a will, there is a way. And if you want to be a part of that child's life, if it has to be through the courts, or as just mentioned a few minutes ago through negotiation, uh, it is essential that you uh, are in that child's life. 
and you're just going to have to make it happen. Uh, it's very clear to me that, uh, uh, first of all, I, I struggle to even imagine how, how much of that that is in our community. But in my mind, uh, to believe in your fatherhood is something that you need to fight for. And you best believe that you will have to fight for it. Uh, unfortunately, our relationship with the women in our lives sometimes isn't the best. But even if it's not, if you want to believe in your children, you have to fight for that right. And you have to fight with all you've got because having a father in your life, I think, is a very, very important thing for for our people's personal growth. You know, and I, and I would just say the creator set an example, a model for us, and that is for the man and the woman to to to, to do this together. So ideally, you would want that you know, you want to be, you know, you want to be married and, and, and do it. You know, I just believe that that's the best way that you get married and that you have, you know, the responsibility jointly together. But and that in the event that that doesn't happen or a divorce happens or whatever, then it becomes that much more challenging for the child. And they're the innocent party in the process. And so I would say men have to step up and teach men how to be not just men, but to be fathers. I think we need to step up and, and engage our young men, our men, on what it means to be a father. And regardless of, uh, and again, you lead by example. Uh, and in, in the event that you have challenges communicating with the child because of the mother, and sometimes the mothers can be very, very, very difficult and allowing you to maintain communicate, communication and contact as a father, then you, you do those things apart, you know, until you are able to have that conversation with that son or daughter as their adults. That, that was almost kind of like my situation. I raised them up until the point where I knew uh, that, the, that the relationship with their mom was not going to be a lasting one. I poured into them what I, knew, what I knew that I needed to pour into them at that time. And I prayed that God would give me opportunity to share with them you know, my side of the story when they came to, when they wanted to hear it. And in the meantime, uh, prepared things, uh, still did things with them as a father, you know, made preparations for them with books and stories and letters and things like that, that I, that I was able to share with them that were roadblock or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but the, the, to me, the ideal way is to, is to marry their mom and, and live as a family. Um, and, and then you're constantly, your presence will not be thwarted or, um, or challenged or, or come to question, you know. So thank you everyone for um, sharing. I, I just want to say how um, just thankful and appreciative I am of each of you for being here today, as well as um, uh, Pastor Dr. Nelson uh, for being here with us today to, to have this discussion about fatherhood and, and letting us get some wisdom and some nuggets from you um, about your experience as a father. Uh, and so thank you, uh, Jay, uh, Baba, Arndell, and Kwamina for being here today with us. Um, this is uh, part six. Um, uh, part seven will be um, on, um, on Sunday. I'm sorry, we're actually not doing it on Sunday this week because of Father's Day. We want to respect Father's Day. And so we are doing our um, our next session on Saturday, which is a change. So that's a little different than what we normally do. Saturday at 8.30, still at 8.30. And we're talking about legal aspects uh, around um, of just the movement for change. And we, again, our perspectives with Black men, we have um, some great Black men joining us um, from the legal field. We have um, some, my army buddy, who's a lawyer and an actor, uh, Cornelius uh, Porter, will be here with us. We also have um, one of my best friends, um, who's a lawyer as well, um, Alex, Alexander Simpson, will be here with us. We'll also have... Um, Akron Municipal Court Judge David Hamilton with us um, as well. Um, and um, the ACLU, um, one of their, their legal um, 
individuals, um, legal uh, counsels uh, in Georgia. Chris Bruce will be with us. And um, also um, right here from uh, right here in Akron as well, we have um, a legal um, commentary and perspectives from Darren Tony. So come to us on Saturday at 8.30 to experience uh, the legal aspects of um, what we're trying to fight for change here uh, and know that we will be doing what our tagline says, what our mission for Perspectives with Black Men is, is our voices, our experiences, our solutions. So we wanna hear from our voices, hear about our experiences and also get, get solutions from Black men. So that's what we're doing with this series. And again, I wanna thank each and every one of you for being here today. I um, mean, with that, everyone have a great evening and have a great rest of the week. And I hope to see you tune in again on Saturday. Thank hey, you. thank you for having me, man. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm so, I'm so happy you can make it. All it was you. a pleasure. It was definitely right. a pleasure. Yeah, yes. appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Have a great day. Take care. Right. Yeah. All right.